What's up, everybody? Uh, I'm over here cooking dinner with hooks, rubs, and spices. Uh, B-Rob turned me on to this stuff, and i tell you what, it's great. It's a homemade blend of the finest ingredients sourced from Texas gardens, farmers, and markets. And it's some good shit. i tell you what, try the smoke and sweetness, or you can try Hoppy's favorite, the Mad Cow, which is a nice peppery slap in the face. <laughs> One taste, and you'll be hooked. Hooks, rubs, and spices. You are now listening to Random Ramblings with What up, everybody? This your boy, B-Rob, and I'm back with another edition of the Random Rounds with Rob podcast. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you, the listener, for coming back each and every week or however you listen to podcasts. You may, I don't know, stockpile them two or three weeks at a time. Then whenever you're bored, sitting on your couch, you don't watch all the Netflix and you done chilled numerous amounts of times, copious amounts of times. You're starting to... um get little bed sores and everything and you just decided like oh shit I got three weeks worth of podcasts stacked up from the other other, um, weeks I'm going to listen to those right now you might have did that or if you're a new listener I appreciate you for taking the chance on the show and whoever referred you if anybody referred you give them a clean germ free high five you know get you some hand sanitizer squirt a little bit on there or do it the old fashioned way get you a bar of soap some dove, some dial, maybe wash them hands up real good. Get a lather going. Dry them off with paper towels, a cloth towel, preferably. And high five. There it is. All right. Today, I have a guest. There have been uh, not so many comedians that have been on the random rounds with Rob. I think we're we at 113 episodes now. And I've only had S. Anthony Thomas, uh, Josh O, uh, Foxy, who is a local comedian here in Houston, Texas. And um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and add on to that list this evening or whenever time of the day it is that you listen to this podcast. My guest is David Hodge. Did I say that right? Is it Hodge or Hodge? Yep, Hodge. Yes. So. Or Hodge, I don't know. Depends. I'm good either way, but I, I go with Hodge. All right, because I know... I've know. been called much worse. Yeah. <laughs> Call you anything <laughs> but bitch, right? <laughs> I've been called that plenty of times, but that's not the point here. I agree, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's great company. I love S. S- Anthony Thomas. He's a real funny dude. Uh, Mr. O, love him. Don't know Foxy yet, but hey, I have to go find, dig through your, you know, your shows and find out and check her out. Yes, or you can go to YouTube. Uh, I got a we, t- we took a lovely stroll through the halls of Walmart, and we got that on video. Nice. That's she, always a fun time. Yes, and she was lit. <laughs> nice. Even better. That's yeah. the only way you should be there anyway. Hell yeah. It's like I go there sober every day, and it's like I'm drunk. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Now, I don't... Like, you know, when yeah. your six X yoga pants don't fit, you should, you know, really learn a couple lessons on that, you know? Yeah, me and um Jody B had an extensive conversation about yoga pants. What 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 is your feeling on yoga pants? If you if you can pull them off, go for it. Which is not hard to do. But the second you don't pull it off, you change what you're doing. I don't know, either what you're wearing or something else. Just because it's a little cheaper doesn't mean we want to see the rest of you like that. Well, I, I can agree with you. It's not hard to pull them off, but um, right. putting them on might be the difficult part. <laughs> right. If you're having issues putting on yoga pants, you're not supposed to be wearing them. Exactly. But according to Jody B, he don't give a damn. He's like, if you took the time and effort to squeeze them things around your thighs and buttock area, he is uh, delighted. Listen, I love Jody B. However, if you're doing it and, you know, you stretch to the point where it's see-through, 
that's not really a look. You might as well be naked. You better up pulling that look off. <laughs> yes, this is a true statement. But anyway, uh, enough with the yoga pants debate, sir. Okay. I, I I know not much about you. I've come across your Twitter handle many times on the Twitterverse. Uh, I heard you yes. most recently on um, the Poor Boys podcast. And, um, that was a lot of fun, as this is so far. Yes, and um, you're here because, I mean, you're a purchase of, uh, of interest to me. And usually the way I, how I work, I mean, I pick people at random. And most of the time, it's just people that, like I said, I, I've come across um, more than one time across the Internet or whatever. I've had people from uh, – I had a guy from India on here and I heard him um, just randomly on YouTube. He raps English, but he's from India. Like, so he has his accent, but he's trying to do an American rap. So I was like, nice. I need to talk to that guy. <laughs> so th- that's the random. Nice. I can't even. What's his name? Sun J. S U N dash J. And you can look him up on YouTube as well. You got all his spoken word and rap um, audio all up on there. Nice. But yeah, um, I was in and out of you and um, Jody B interview or whatever. So I got bits and pieces of it. I'm not going to lie to you and say I sat there with Beta That's Breath all right. and uh, listened to the whole thing. I know you like to fuck them where they breathe. I know that much. Well, I learned that from my mom. That's what my mom saying. <laughs> but yes, that's what I learned from him. And uh, we do ser- share uh, uh, similarities here. Um, you're a former, a, a, for- a former, I can't talk. <laughs> you're a former service member, correct? Yes, I am. 11 Bravo, U.S. Army. All right. I- I'll give you a pass on that since you're a guest and you're a comedian. <laughs> but um, I, I, right. I, I just finished up uh, 16 years in the Marine Corps. Good. Uh, my uncle was in the Marine Corps. I have family members from every branch. Yeah, same thing. How many siblings you got? <laughs> None. Oh. I literally broke them all 36 hours of labor with my mother. Paying oh. ass since day one. Yeah, so I can kind of see why you used the first and only. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Oh, and the water broke about 19 hours in. So, yeah, she was really loving that. Oh, man. You use a miracle child. <laughs> yeah. Um, my first two kids, it was just like, um, they were both C-section because their mom was like real itty bitty and everything. So she couldn't carry them to full term. So they had to get cesarean right. out the older two. Um, years later, I remarried and, um, my wife now, she had her first child, our first child. And, um, she carried the baby all the way to term, big fat baby, almost 10 pounds. And, uh, nice. that thing didn't want, she didn't want to come out. <laughs> Uh, it was like we had to go. I had to take it to the hospital three times. The first time we went, it was like, oh, it's not time or whatever. Go <laughs> home. We'll try again next time. OK, take her home next day. Oh, we need to go to the hospital. Bring her back to the hospital. And she was like, no, nah, you're not ready. You're not dilated enough. Go home. We'll try again another time. So the third time I knew this had to happen. She was having the same pains that she was having the previous two times. And I was just like, me and my infinite wisdom, because I've had, well, I didn't have shit. I didn't have any kids because I'm a guy. I can't do that. But I got you. I've been around a woman that had two of my kids beforehand. And, and um, I was just like, here, yeah, drink this orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> so she drank the orange juice. Same thing. We jump in the car. We riding. And I knew the baby was going to come this time because right before we got to the hospital, she threw up all in the car, orange juice, all on the floorboards, all in the window jam, all in the side little, you know, you put the change in the co- all that shit, orange juice everywhere. So I was like, yeah, we're not leaving the hospital this time because now I need time for you to stay in this room, try to birth this baby while I'm in the parking lot trying to clean up all this mess. Oh, boy. So another one, pain in the ass since the beginning, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, C-sections, the thing with that is, you know, once you have one, you're not usually able to have it the other way anyway. So, you know. Yeah, pretty you much. Don't, you just don't want to rack up those scars like, you know, the afternoon strip club girls. <laughs> and so I don't think some of those are C-sections, though. That's just like battle scars, well, yeah, maybe. Some of them. 
Yeah, some of them have other battle scars, I agree. But I, I figure I'll be nice and lump them together. Okay, all right. <laughs> now, um, My good dude for the day. With the, with the military thing, like, um, now you're doing comedy, but what drove you into military service? Actually, for comedy and, you know, for the military, those are two things I always wanted to do growing up. Uh, back, I mean, I'm a little older of a gentleman. I'm in my late 40s, so mm-hmm. I remember watching the Vietnam War live on TV as a kid, you know what I mean? Uh, my mom was one of those morbid people that would watch because she had a lot of friends and, you know, relatives that were over there, so she was just, you know, hoping not to see their names when they were going go through a scroll of people that they had died that day. Yeah. And that's not what I looked at God from it. I just saw all the, you know, all the heroes that were out and my godfather who was in the Marines, you know, for a very long time. And, he, he, I, you know, I saw a lot of his stuff and he was a hero to me. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, I could, you know, remember the commercials, be all you could be, join the Army. I was like, that makes sense. And as a five-year-old, it did. <laughs> and it was just one of those things that, you know, kind of stuck with me. Yeah. So I was like, hey, you know, I wanted, one of the things I got to high school and freshman year, me and my, my new group of friends from high school, we decided, hey, once you graduate, we're just going to move out to California. So when, you know, my parents told me that, oh, yeah, we spent all your college money, you know, on your dad's bail money, uh, we're going to wind up having, you know, you're going to wind up paying for that yourself or you're not going. Besides, look at the way you screwed up your grades. How do you expect us to pay for something you're not going to do well in? Mm-hmm. So I did the logical thing and said, well, don't give the GI bill to me. And I fulfilled my promise and my want, and I got stationed in California. Ooh, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, weird things, you know, weird determination things. Yeah, this is like um, pretty much similar. I mean, my my siblings are way older than me. Uh, we have a big gap between me. I'm the baby in my family. There's a uh, 18 of us total. And Good for you. Good for your mom. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's collective. Um, my mom. Okay. Well, then good for your dad. Yeah. <laughs> my, 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 <laughs> my mom had uh, six kids. I'm the, I'm the last of hers. My dad with his first wife had uh, 12. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. So kudos to her. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, actually one, one of my old team leaders in the army. Uh, he lives out in Gary, Indiana. Uh, him and his wife now are up to fourteen kids. What the fuck? Yeah, and he doesn't have that good military benefits anymore. So I don't know what the hell's going on in his brain. I don't know. And then, like, from what I understand, because uh, we had people that um we served with or whatever. Once you get to a certain amount of kids, they start they stop paying. <laughs> Yeah. So I was just like, I mean, why? I don't know. Maybe they, they old scripture or whatever. Just like, if I put it in, it's going to stay in. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. but it's... I get that old school mentality, you know? You know. Huh. My, that, that's how my, my dad broke it down to me. Like, listen, if you're man enough to fuck a girl, you got to be man enough to take care of a baby if it happens. Don't go playing games you don't want to handle responsibility for. Yeah. I mean... <sighs> I don't know. This is like I, I'm. I'm agreeing with you, and you, you know your father is a wise man or whatever. But I know damn well. You just condoms out there. There's condoms. There's ways to get around it. If you're fucking around. You're not doing the right thing. You almost deserve what you get. Yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. <laughs> yeah, you know, you wind up with some, you know, some disease or whatever. Not even kid. You wind up with, you know, any kind of thing happening. You know, uh, did you ever go uh, overseas? Yes, I've been to Iraq three times and Afghanistan one time. Okay. All right. So you didn't get the pleasure of going to like uh, Korea? Ha! No. <laughs> See. There's a, there's a special video they, they show you before you head over, and there's something they call the Black, black Death. That is a type yeah. of venereal disease. Yeah, I've heard of that. The I don't bl- know if you guys have seen syphilis. that video. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you wind up, uh, they send a letter to your family saying that you are a casualty. In a military incident, and you're ba- they basically claim you as dead, and they basically quarantine you away till you die. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I learned, and I joined, I went in when I was seventeen, you know, because I, I, I graduated at seventeen. So I was like, yeah, no, I'm not trying to fuck any of these bitches. I'm, I'm good. Yeah, and that was another thing too, like Korea, Thailand. That'll scare the shit out of you. Yeah, like Korea, Thailand, and all those places, whatever. It's like. Yeah, you're saying I'm not fucking none of those bitches, and some of those bitches might be dudes. <laughs> yeah, especially Thailand. 
Oh. No, I'm not saying I did it, but I was a lot more careful. <laughs> yeah, you just like doing the throat check and shit. Let me. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah, that too, yes. But uh, also, uh, my only time, I was only in the Middle East for like six months. So I didn't hear, you know, I was on the MFO mission on the, uh, the Israeli Saudi border. Yeah. But like, man, it's just. When I heard of that, so the, the freaking. Uh, the the black plague, the syphilis, or whatever the fuck yep. you call it. It was like, that was, that was the main sticking point or whatever. It was just like, if you catch this shit, you're not going home. You're staying. Yeah, there. you're done. Yeah. And it was just like, this and you, you hope you die soon in that one. Yeah. Cause it's like, it eats your penis from the inside out. <laughs> yeah. And it starts rotting the rest of your body after that. It's like, Oh, I mean, and that's another thing too. It's just like, the carrier, the person that you would get this thing from, what the fuck they look yeah. like? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, there's a reason you don't go down on prostitutes, so, I mean, you know, you're going to wind up missing that one if there's something to say. I don't know. Uh, that's that's horrible. Uh, yeah. How did we get here? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, we were talking about the military and all oh, the things I wanted. Like I said, you know, growing up, uh, I used to sneak, you know, uh, like George Carlin and Eddie Murphy and just listen to that stuff, you know. When I, although my parents enjoyed that stuff. Like, listen, you don't have to go, you know, into the basement with the tape player. You can listen to that up here. Just, you know, when the, when my, my father was, you know, kind of strict. He's like, if this motherfucker's going to be cursing, don't play it in front of your mother. Damn respect. I'm mm-hmm. like, all right, that makes sense. Yeah. As he's cursing in front of my mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's, they'll do as I say not what I do you know what I mean yeah and, th- and that's definitely a mentality I got here especially with the older two kids you can gauge my level of um, how pissed off I am because I can go from casual tone like we have now and then the first motherfucker will fly out and then oh yeah be followed by shit ass and all that mother- <laughs> <laughs> so depending on how much I'm cussing in the I guess the rate of cuss words that come out it, it, that's that's how you can gauge how mad I am. <laughs> oh yeah. Now you've always lived down south. Yes. Um. I, cut, saying cuss is how I know. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I always like hearing that. It, it, it's a term of endearment to me. So. Yeah. Is it, Cussing. I I like. That's such a nice word <laughs> for something so filthy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, it kind of threw me off. You, it's making me. Uh, I'm sorry. Make it make me pick my words more carefully. Just, just cuss it out. Just cuss her away. I'm, I'm with you. You just cuss it out. Yeah. Yeah, but that's what I was telling them when they, when they got a little older or whatever. I, I sat the older two down. And I was just like, look, I'm not gonna be naive, and I'm not gonna pretend that I don't know that y'all curse whenever y'all talk to your friends. Right. But. I listen to what you're saying on Xbox, even though you think I'm sleeping. Yeah. But <laughs> don't you, and this is exactly word for word what I said. I said, but don't let me catch your ass cussing in front of me or your motherfucking mama. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that's how, that's how I had to drive the point home. I had to let them know I was serious, monotone, cuss words. There you go. <laughs> My, my son, you know, he doesn't curse in front of me and he knows better. But every now and then he'll let it slip while he's playing video games and he'll just look at me. I'm like, don't worry about it, guys. Cause I, I know he's yelling at his friends and they're cursing at each other. I don't want him to pussy out with his friends there. You know, I'm, I'm an adult enough to understand that, like, he's not being an asshole right now. They're just playing games. So I get it. Yeah. And, and, he knows not to, you know, do it in front of me or, you know, like his grandfather or anything. Yeah. And so, the, the, my only concern is not so much the oldest of the two older ones is my son the middle kid um he pal around with the baby a lot it's the seven-year-old so i'm yeah. constantly on his ass i was like dude watch your mouth in front of your sister you know exactly <laughs> and then i found out that the baby the seven-year-old she know uh cuss words in spanish now <laughs> And the, nice. <laughs> and then the reason, uh, this is how I figure out, because we here in Texas now. Uh, this where we. Uh, this is where I retired. That at. just makes sense. Then. Yeah, this is where I retired it. So, my son, he was taking Spanish, and he's pretty good at it. He's making A's and B's and shit. And I was like, since we live here in Texas now, 
I don't care what do you do with all your extracurricular uh, classes or whatever. You can take band, you can take figure skating. I don't give a shit what you do, but it's mandatory. I don't never tell you too much of what to do. I'll never push you toward nothing at all, but your ass is taking Spanish. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because as long as you live in Texas, you have to. Yeah, I was like, as long as we live in Texas, you're going to need to know this shit because I might need you to translate some shit for me. <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. They need it for their own good plus to help you out as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I, like I said, if you don't want to play sports, no problem. I mean, that's not for everybody. I don't push it on them, yeah. but this is the only thing that I put my foot down on. It's like, your ass is staying in Spanish. <laughs> And then, so anyway, back to what I was saying, um, we was in the car and, um, I do security. So sometimes I'm at immigration court to where I deal with people that speak Spanish. So since he's pretty good at it, I asked him, you know, a couple of pieces of words here and there. So I was like, uh, boots, how do you say boots in Spanish? And, um, I think he said butos with a B. So, <laughs> so you know what I was thinking? Yeah. But the baby, I can hear her whispering because, you know, younger kids think they whispering, but they're not really whispering. She, yeah, they haven't learned that yet. Yeah, she was like, art. she's like, did you just curse? Did you say a cuss word? <laughs> He's <laughs> like, no, I said Butos with a B. And she was like, oh, I was like, how the fuck do you know what he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. So the seven year old is, is the, she the ringleader of the three kids. We got the oldest one who was the boss. We got the, the, the middle boy. He the henchman. And then the baby is just like the mastermind. It's just like, you think the oldest one is in charge, but the baby is running the show. That's usually how it works out, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, as, as far as, um, you had your, your interest in the military and comedy kind of run parallel to each other. It was around the same time, you know. So, like, whenever you were in the military, going to di- different places or anything, had it ever occurred to you to maybe try stand up, or did you even practice that on some of your fellow service mates? Uh, well, I was in practice stand up, but I, w- I was always, you know, the guy telling a joke. You know, I m- my thing, you know, I would it was always a, a, a deflection thing for myself. You know, I mean, I was small kid, you know, growing up and. You know, uh, I just wanted to, my thing was I was always able to try and think of something funny and witty and, or, you know, sometimes douchey. Some, you know, people get pissed off because I'm like, all right, I'm just trying to say something to so just throw it out there. And then some people would really love it. And then every now and then it was like, all right, now you've just crossed the line. What the hell's the matter with you? And, you know, it was just something that I enjoyed personally doing because it became, I became good at it. So I tried doing it more and I never thought of doing stand up because I thought it was something that was so unattainable as a kid. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah, how do you even get into that? You know what I mean? They're not just going to let me walk into a club. What do I know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, just being a naive kid, I never even, it never even occurred to me, especially, you know, my my dad would, like, you know, it, it discourage me from doing anything related to, like, arts. Like, just get a damn job and don't worry about that shit. Like, uh, when I was in high school, I modeled for a year. And it was underwear and swimsuit modeling, which was, you know, I didn't mind, and it was cool. I got to meet a lot of women, uh-huh. well, girls, you know. They were all, those women were my peers. We were all in high school. And, uh, that was something that was kind of cool until my dad saw the, uh, the manager running the show, and he was very offended that this very large, muscular, gay black man was staring at his son's ass, and he was very offended by that. <laughs> so one, the one show he actually showed up to that I was not expecting him to, like he, like he wasn't even planning on being there. It was just one of those things. He, uh, you know, he he decided to yell at my office, like, "Hey, why don't we just watch the kid?" And they came, and he saw what was going on. I did two walks. I did, you know, went down with uh, two different types of speedos, and literally, the last set of speedos I had for about twenty years after that, because my dad literally pulled me off the, you know, as soon as I got off the stage, he just pulled me to the side and said, "That's it. We're getting the fuck out of here right now." And I was like, "What? What?" So I didn't get paid for that, but you know, I, will, I mean, they, there was a check that I had to pick up well after that, but you know, it was like, well, what happened? You lost. I'm like, Oh, my parents were here. I had to go. It was a family emergency <laughs> <laughs> and I wound up not going back. And it was weird because my dad had friends that did like acting and modeling and stuff. And, uh, how old are you? I, I'm sorry. I'm just, 
going to be rude about it than that. Um, Give or take. I'll be 36 at the end of this month. Okay. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, there was a movie in the 80s called Sleepaway Camp. Yes. I don't know if you know uh, it. Oh, yes. I, you know it. I own this movie. <laughs> All right, so then the next time you watch it, the camp counselor, Paulie, is my dad's best friend growing up. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, any time I thought about looking at movies and anything like that or acting a model, this was the one time he let me do anything, and any other time I even approached the subject, I was like, no, no, no. Just because of whatever issues he had, he's like, yeah, you don't get into that, there's a bunch of child molesters out there, which, I mean, now when you look back at it, I'm like, hey, I guess he was yeah. right, but... <laughs> You know, he's like, yeah, he's like, you're not doing any of that stuff. And I'm like, ah, I, I tried doing extra work and stuff. And as long as my dad didn't know about it, I was able to. Yeah. I did like two after school specials. I was, uh, I did background and my dad was like, ah, ah, good job. Way to go. How much you get paid? Uh, nobody cares. Then. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to work, you go get work for a damn living. What's wrong with you? I'm like, uh, I'm 12. I don't know. <laughs> That was the thing that I was trying to do when I first, uh, when we first moved down here. I was just, uh, looking for little independent joints around here. I just, I didn't even want speaking roles. I just wanted to be the motherfucker in the background pushing a broom or picking up trash or some stupid shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, also, if you do that union, you get a decent paycheck. You get like 200 bucks a day. Yeah. Uh, see, I'm down with that. I mean, that, that's. Yeah. I mean, the work's not steady, but you get 200 bucks every day that they have. Not a bad deal. They damn, um, I, I, I happened upon a, a, a little gig here most recently. I do security. So I was downtown at one of the, um, the buildings that I see over and they had uh, two gentlemen out there on the street. They were, had the um, cool little cameras. It's like a camera on a stick and it articulates and do all kind of crazy shit. So they was out there um, filming the buildings and all kind of things like that. So here I am. I got my outfit on. I'm looking like a cop. I got my gun on my hip and everything. And I'm just standing there watching them. And I'm looking at this camera. And this camera is just doing all kind of crazy shit. It's just rotating around and everything. And it's, it looks badass. So it they, sounds it. I like it. So they seen me looking at them. And um, me being a dick, I went up to them. And I was just stone face I, I had my mug on mean and then i walked up to him i was like i, I was like hey hey and they and they was like oh shit and i was like where'd you get that camera from that's really nice <laughs> <laughs> and you know you, you see him kind of calm the switch down. Roof. yeah you see him calm down a little bit his shoulders relax <laughs> and i was just like and then we just sat there and we talked a little bit um and they were they're a local production crew. So we exchange business cards because I carry business cards for my podcast. And right. um, he hit me up a couple of days later and he was like, hey, man, we shooting a video. Uh, you want to be an extra? I was like, you got damn right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got into that little role of being an extra. <laughs> that's something I, I'm looking forward to doing a little more. Of. I've done some like really like, you know, Really, uh, let's just say low budget independent films. Mm -hmm. Not porn. I'm just saying low budget independent <laughs> films. Now, some of them have some sex scenes in it that the guy likes to throw in gratuitously. Yes. Because he has a few, uh, former strippers that enjoy other former strippers company. Yes. And I, I don't mind watching those scenes in the movie, even though I'm not in those scenes, but I'll be a fan of watching what, what happens besides me being in it. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just like, you know, you're there, there's free catering, there's some titties might be on the screen. Exactly. You know, you know, you get you get like 50 bucks to sit there and do this really cheesy movie, say, hey, I was in a movie, and somebody watched it, like, you look terrible in that, but did you see the tits on those girls? Yeah. And it's like, yes, that's why I like being there. Yes, I got to hang with those people all day. <laughs> exactly. Not the 2.3 seconds you see me on screen, but like all day after. <laughs> We were on a set all day. You only got to see me for two seconds. I got to see tits a lot longer. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> just being an asshole, being a director is like, cut. All right. Um, can we get some makeup on these boobs? And I'm getting a lot of glare yeah, on the lens. Do you, do you need help powdering them? <laughs> get the glare off. I'm ready to help. See, we we saying this shit now. Next thing you know, you're going to open up your timeline on Twitter and shit and be like, freaking David Hodge has been accused of sexual misconduct. 
<laughs> oh no, I, I did. I, everything was consensual. I will say that now. I'm weird like that. I've always been weird like that. But you know, anything like that comes up, you know, it's a damn lie. You know, I was thinking about, you know, all this stuff that's going on or whatever. I, I was thinking about it most recently. It reminded me of that Dave Chappelle skit from the Dave Chappelle show. It was like, yes. Oh my God. Yes. Here, sign here. Sign here. He said, initial here. Um, initial here for anal. <laughs> <laughs> and initial here for it's a great oral. Thing. He was way ahead of his time. Yeah. And bro. still is. That dude. Yeah. It's, I know you was talking about George Carlin and everybody before. I mean, who else was some of your influences as far as comedy goes? Influences people like I admired growing up or like people that influence me and in what I do now. Either or. I like that. Okay. Uh, I grew up loving, like like I said, Carl and Murphy prior because thankfully I had that growing up. And I used to hear like listening to that and like I would always hear my parents, oh, you know, they're they think they're edgy now. They should have heard Red Fox back in the day, or uh, what the hell is the other white guy's name? Fucking oh, the guy that went to court all the time before Carlin. I can't think of his name right now. Shit. But anyway, it was like, oh, you gotta listen to these people. They were really edgy, and you know, when you compare that stuff to what we hear now, not that edgy. And it's like, wow. I'm like, yeah, this is what people were clamoring about. What was their pro? What what stick was up their ass for this? You know, it's like. You know, then you have uh, George Carlin taking going to the Supreme Court about what you can say and can't say on television, and like that happened. When, I mean, I was a kid, but I was always talked about. Every, you know, after that, so that was always something like, "Oh wow, free speech!" And being the proud service member I am and proud of my country, I was like, "You damn right, First Amendment." And that's another thing that why it sticks with me. Yeah, which you know I like with comedy. Uh, more recent people I like uh, Patrice O'Neill. I miss him dearly. I only got to meet him once. Great guy. Super funny. Jim Norton. Uh, I was just backstage at his show in uh, Red Bank at the Count Basie Theater because fr- another comedian friend of mine used to be like an assistant to him, you know, with his merchandise and website and stuff. And it was, it was really cool hanging out with him. And I've met him a few times. Nicest guy. Very funny. Very filthy, but very funny. Uh, Bill Burr curses a lot, but not filthy. You know what I mean? He'll yeah. throw the... He doesn't curse in th- for the sake of cursing, but he will throw the fuck to exaggerate the point. And, you know, that I can enjoy. That's enjoyable. Like, there's some people that will just curse, and it's just like, all right, yeah, you just drop like 30 cusses in a, in a row. Yeah, like uh, Bill Burr. Um, you, you ever listen to his podcast? Sometimes. Yeah, it's just like I, I listen to it like maybe two or three times, and like I kind of... I don't know. I guess I kind of relate to what he's talking about on this podcast or how he does his podcast. Cause I mean, if you right. heard me in the intro or whatever, I mean, he kind of sounds like that to me. It's just like all the shit just comes to his head and he says the shit, <laughs> you know? I think that's why he does the pod. I think that's why podcasting has become big with comedians because it gives us an, another venture outside of our act to focus on venting. Like it's easily like, you know, you, because if you try to go on stage with something that you're venting about, you may look like a jerk. And then yeah. I tried that earlier tonight, actually, which is, you know, I'm like, oh, that, that didn't work. All right, well, let me do some actual material now. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, I see, and that's the thing that I was thinking about, too. I mean, people have come to me be like, hey, man, you ever thought about doing a stand up or whatever? I was like, nah, I would rather sit down. Dad pun. So. Yep. And um, I was just like, well, what I would tell them, I was like, have you listened to the show? I was like, this is my stand up. Like, this is probably as close as I'm going to get, <laughs> you know, because I mean, I respect you guys that do all this stuff. And, you know, you take time um, to hone your craft or whatever. And just I don't feel like I would do it justice. I'm not saying I can't do it. I'm just saying that, you know. I don't think I could do it to the level of like, say what you're doing now, you've been doing it for a while or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. I just, I know I ain't ready for that shit. <laughs> I know what you're saying. Well, like, this way, like I'm a sick parent. So finding the time to hone it at an actual, like you could practice in your living room, staring at the mirror, whatever it is, however you want to try and get your words out to see your facial expressions. That's good for a certain point, but you also have to learn how to gauge a crowd. Yeah. and gauge on their reaction and when to throw in a pause break in because you're never going to get that judgment when you're looking at yourself in the mirror. So 
So you actually have to be out there more often. Yeah. And that's something that I'm only doing recently now that my son's, you know, almost done with his sophomore year of high school. So, you know, now he's a little older, I could go out like two nights, two, three nights a week and not have to worry, oh, the little kid's home. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't have to worry about a babysitter. Now I just go and I'm like, all right, you know, sit on your Xbox. I'll be back in about two hours. Yeah. You know, give me a couple hours. I'll be back. Time for bed at that point. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I make sure homework's done when I get in from the day job. Make sure he's doing what he has to do. I'm like, all right, you sure this is all I've done? And I go and I check. Because now I can check on the website what work is needs to be done. Exactly. And, oh, well, I'm so, I am so happy they didn't have that when I was a kid. Because I would have been yeah. beaten so many more times. <laughs> Well, you know, but now that he, like I said, now that he's older and I get called, I'm like, all right, we're sure we're ready. We're good. What, you know, we, you ate, we're ready. I'm like, you need anything else? I'm going, I'll be back in a couple hours. No, no, I got this. I got this. And he can't wait. He wants to, you know, play whatever Call of Duty or whatever he's playing tonight, you know, because he has three hours to just sit on the big TV in the living room and not be bothered. Exactly. Yeah, see, and, lock the door, he's safe. See, and that was another thing is just like, I did have a fear of public speaking, but what, okay. I, what, what I found out was it's not I didn't have a fear of public speaking. It was I had a fear of damn presenting material in public. <laughs> OK, so what what, what I mean is because like um, before I retired, the last duty station I was at, I was in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I'm pretty sure you might may have heard. Fort Lawson it was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That place. Um. I was an instructor there for um, transportation. So okay. when I got there, um, we had to go through the what they call the Fort Leonard Wood Academy. They teach us how to teach a class. You know, they teach you how to right. set up your curriculum, the equipment, how to present the classroom, how to talk and all this shit. So prior to that, I was just nervous as fuck because... You know, I'm be standing in front of people, you know, re- giving material. And, you know, I know, right. I know the material, but I don't know it to the level of how they want me to teach it, I guess. It's just like they, they want me to give specific pressure, PSI and, you know, yeah. t- all this bullshit. You know, I mean, I know how to do it, but I know, I don't know the exact numbers and, the, you know, all the, the intricacies and shit or whatever. So I was nervous about that. But um after we went through the classes, they taught us everything. And um I passed. And I finally get in front of the actual students or whatever. The first time was horrible. I mean, I, I was up there sweating, fucking shaking and shit. But after a while, it's just like, this is what I know about myself. You know, I'm just like, once it's done the first time and, you know, if I can, if I fail or if I succeed, the shit is done. So now I don't, I don't worry about it no more. It's just like the level of, I don't give a fuck goes up. <laughs> exactly. So I was and, like, and, you know, that's exactly like comedy. Cause a lot of times we're, we're nervous cause we're not as prepared as people that have been doing it a while. So your first time was like, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right or what I'm doing right. And not only do you know, but the people around you could tell. And then finally, like you said, that I don't give a fuck level goes up. And it's like, yeah, that's right. I got this. It's no problem. Whatever. I'm going to do this joke and this joke. You know what I mean? So it's, in a sense, the same thing. And the weird thing is, like, with comedy, even if you're not having a good night, there's something about it that's like, I know I'm going to do better next time. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. because that I don't give a fuck level is up there. Yeah. So therefore, like, you can actually push forward with that. Mm-hmm. Like- not trying to tell you to go out and do stand-up, but if you feel like you might, <laughs> you you that as your background for it. Well, my my thing was, this is just like, after that first time was over, I mean, I did, I, I to me, I did real bad. I mean, but, you know, I've been told because um, there's always an instructor or um, a more tenured instructor in the back of the class whenever you teach so they can um right. do the critique sheet and everything. So, you know what you did wrong, where you can improve and everything. And they'll give that to you at the end of each class. So, you know, I didn't do bad but to me I mean inside my skin I was just like that shit fucking sucked so the next time I went up there you you were ready to go the next time because of that the next time I went up there I was just like after I got the notes back I was just like he was like be more relatable and um so I just went back to the class setting that you know when when I started when they was teaching us how to give the class they always talking about um, what they call the whiffum what's in it for me 
So okay. when you open up the class, you um usually lead off with a story. You'd be like, um, my go-to was um, PMCS, Preventive uh, Maintenance Checks and Services. So when I would give that class, I would always give them the story about how um I got my first car. I was like, I, I got my first car. My dad gave it to me. It was already 10 years old when I got it. It was a 1990 Chrysler Fifth Avenue. Big burgundy thing. Could comfortably fit eight people in there. Four in the front, four in the back. <laughs> and, um, oh, yeah. Four in the back, you know. Two up the fat. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, and I told him, I was like, man, just... I was 15 years old. I was the only freshman with a freaking car. You know, I didn't give a shit about it. You know, it was already 10 years old. It was kind of raggedy, but it ran. And that's how I treated it. As long as the car started up and I had gas, I was good. I didn't check the brakes. I didn't check the tires. I didn't do nothing to this car. So one night I went to Taco Bell with some of my friends after we went to a movie. And um, we... Went there, we got burritos and all kinds of Mexican pizzas and everything because Taco Bell is my jam. That's my favorite spot to go other than Walmart. So, okay, we leave Taco Bell, we getting in the car. I started up, it's just vroom, 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 poof, and a big white puff of smoke come up from under the hood and everything. <laughs> so, I popped the hood, smoke coming out. There's a freaking radiator fluid coming all out from the bottom and everything. And I'm just sitting there looking at this car smoke and leak fluid all over the Taco Bell parking lot while I'm eating a seven layer burrito. <laughs> so I call my dad. And that's where you learn what throwing a rod meant. <laughs> so I call my dad. He show up. He's like, what the hell you do? And blah, 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 blah. And he cussing and all type of shit. So now and then that's when I turned the story around. I was just like, OK, so how many of you been in this situation? You know, they, you know, they raise a hand. They tell me they own stories and everything. And, uh, we, you know, we go back and forth. And then right before I get into the introduction, I'll be like, well, hopefully by the end of this period of instruction, you won't be that individual stuck on the side of the road eating seven layer burrito <laughs> while your hood is, uh, you know, while your car is smoking. Then I'll be like, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stasson Robinson and your period of instruction today will be preventing maintenance checks and services. I'll be teaching this by going, you know, and you just list the whole thing. What's the purpose of this period of instruction? So you don't be on the side of the road with a cold ass seven layer burrito while your car is on fire. And then you just rattle all down the wrist. It's, it's a, it's a formula. So yeah. W- once I got the formula down, teaching the material wasn't shit. <laughs> You know, because like I knew what was next. You know, you get them with the opener. You hit. You get them with the yep. purpose. You know, you go down the line. It's um something they call the go mist. It's uh you gain attention. Um. Well, damn, I I see. You know what? I ain't gonna even go into it right now because it's escaping me right now. <laughs> I've been That's out of the game. I've been there. Yeah, I've been out of the game for a while, so I don't want to, if anybody is familiar with the Gomez, I don't want to do them any disservice and everything, so I'm going to just leave it alone. But. You know what's crazy? We've both been out for a while, and how many of those things that we learned, all those crazy little, like you just said, once you learn that process, it's almost impossible to get. Now, right now, we're both slipping on certain things like that, but we remember that there is that thing, mm-hmm. the Gomez. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I remember, you know, weird things that I had to do. It was like, oh, wow, you know. What? Why do I still remember this sometimes? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, we learned so much at that time in our lives. That it's, it's so weird what still sticks with us. Yeah. And it just like, if somebody was to put me on the spot right now, I know if I had to do a class, I would fall to that default and it. I, it would just come back to me. And yeah, and it's kind of the same thing with the podcast. Like if you heard the intro, I mean, I got that down verbatim. I mean, I'll deviate <laughs> here and there or whatever as far as like how to however you listen to podcasts and then I'll just might make up some shit that whatever comes to my brain. But after that, it's just like whatever. I mean, we can say whatever the fuck we want after this, as long as I got the intro out. <laughs> yeah. That that's the fun of podcasting. Right? That that's why I enjoy doing it as well. You know what I mean? It's and being on them, doing them with I mean, it's just it's a weird rush that I never thought I would enjoy about a podcast. Yeah. yeah, like you know, when I first heard, I'm like, yeah, that doesn't sound like anything fun. 
I don't know why anybody would do it. And next thing I know, I, I heard a couple that I enjoyed. I'm like, that's kind of cool. And then I was on one. I'm like, I need my own podcast. This is amazing. Yeah. And that's usually how it happens because, I mean, Jody is the example. He yeah. started out listening to podcasts. And then he was a guest on the podcast. And now he's doing his own podcast. Exactly what happened with me. I'm like, wow. And like I said, you know, with comedy, there's a lot of people that in comedy that, that are doing it. So it's like, it's easy to talk to other comics about doing something with you. I have a podcast I do on Monday nights, a comfortably funny podcast. And that's, it's me, a couple of the comedians who are, you know, we live close by to each other. We do it out of my studio, my living room. And, you know, we have some fun. We have people, you know, we have other comics that come on. We have a good time. And sometimes you just want to, sometimes you just vent. You know, we'll vent about the local promoter who's kind of being a pain in the ass to everybody. Or, you know, sometimes, sometimes we'll have some, some, we had some furry guy that calls in that blogs about furries in New Jersey. Just because it's <laughs> weird and interesting. I'm like, eh, and he's local. What the hell? Maybe we go to a furry party. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, anything that a bunch of 40 something year old men can have some fun with, we're in. Yeah. And, and that's what I dig about it too. He's like, I'm, I'm trying to dig in more locally here as well. Cause like Houston, third largest city well fourth largest city in the united states close to being the third damn near two million people in this motherfucker and i'm having a hell of a hard time finding local podcasters in this bitch <laughs> that is weird it's like you i would think houston would have some more yeah i mean they have some i mean there's um what um but they're, the, they're not all as good as yours though. come on <laughs> i wouldn't say that um but it's like <laughs> Uh, uh, Colt Forty Five podcast. I know they um they got a comic book convention here every year. I think is um Comic Palooza or some shit. I fu- I found okay. out about them because they did a um they did a panel there. They did like a show there. So they're okay. they're here. They got um the Gray Area podcast or some shit like that. So I know they're here, and some of them I just haven't reached out to yet. So. It's not like I'm having a hard time, you know, getting making the contact. It's a matter of not being lazy and having some fun with it. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because, I I mean, Houston is a planet. You know, if you go. Yes, it is. If you're going anywhere. It's crazy because it it is very vast an area. Yeah. If you go. I have a friend of mine. He he used to be a fireman over in Katy. Yeah. It was like weird. I went to visit him and another friend of mine. That was living in New Braunfels too. I was like, wow. I was like, like, wait a minute. Didn't we see the entrance to Houston? Like, you know, way back when, and then we're on the Katy Highway. I'm like, well, all right. And then I still see Houston. Next. I'm like, wait a minute. What the hell's going on here? Exactly, man. You got to make a um, a travel plan whenever you're riding around. Houston. Oh yeah. Because I, I, especially now. All right, I live in the north. I live in the northwest part of Houston. Because we just recently moved here. But before we okay. moved, I was um uh, a little further. I was still up north. I was still up north, but I was um more northeast, kind of central. So for me to get to my my house, to my brother' house, um, he lived down southwest. That's like uh, Statford or whatever the fuck. It would take me a good forty five minutes to an hour just to get to his house from my house. Wow. Now we moved to freaking Northwest and just even taking the tollway all the way around to his house, it still take damn near an hour to get to his house. <laughs> yeah. And that's just, and that's straight expressway. That's from, that's, I get on 99, I take 99 all the way, no lights, just straight interstate to his house and it's still damn near an hour to get to his house. <laughs> that's crazy. And it's all but Houston. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the allure of Houston, I think, because it's really a beautiful city. Yeah. And I talk to many people about Houston because, I mean, I'm not a native Houstonian. I'm from Louisiana. <laughs> and uh, I just recently been, I just been in Houston for about a year now. But what I've noticed uh, in Houston, you know, very diverse is, I mean, what I mean by diverse is just like, you can't say that this part of town is the hood because <laughs> it's everywhere. The area, yeah. the area we lived in before we moved to where we are now, my neighborhood was pretty nice. You know, 
two story homes, uh, nice neighborhood parks in the area. You go down the block, take a left, take another left, go up million dollar homes, golf courses. And then from that area, you go right, go down two, three more blocks, make another right. You're in the hood. And you hope you don't get shot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's in a blink of an eye. It's just like, oh, man, look at that mansion. That dude driving a Bentley. Oh, shit. Roll up your windows. Lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that scene in uh, the original vacation movie. Yeah. Where they're looking for directions. And he's like, all right, let's roll up the windows. Let's go. And they already stole the tires. Yeah. And the only other place, <laughs> the only other place I ever been to that's like that was uh, D.C. I was yeah, DC is exactly like that. I went to the Verizon Center and I was riding around. I was like, oh man, the Washington Monument. Oh, look at this fucking museums. Oh shit. Let me stop by Ben's Chili Bowl. <laughs> All right. And yeah, uh, oh damn, I got to park around the corner. It's like, whoa, I went two blocks down and I shouldn't have parked there. Yeah. That, that's exactly <laughs> how it was because I was on, my hotel was on, um, I forget what area, but I I remember the street numbers. I think I was like on 26th Street and I was in a nice little area, 26th Street, went down the block, had McDonald's and, you know, people walking around and everything. But whenever I went to where I went in my car, I came back. I was like, because they got a lot of one way streets. So I was like, oh, shit, they'll go 26, but I can't turn down that way. So I went to 27 and I was like, oh, shit, (laughs) this is just one block (laughs) over. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, man, man. this is bad. (laughs) First time I noticed that at first, my first trip to D.C., I was with my parents. We did like uh, back in the day, they had bus tours like it was like a cruise, but on bus. So we went to like we did uh, Williamsburg and. uh, Bush Gardens, and then we did a, you know, DC, a, a different day. It was a weird thing, you know, weird combination that they, they had. And as soon as we pulled up in the DC, because I'm weird and I know this stuff, you know, we pulled in the hotel and my dad's kind of old fashioned. He just wants to like put everything away and then go explore the area and go check shit out. Mm-hmm. And we got there. He's like, yeah, I'm not sure we should, you know, go anywhere. We got to be careful. I'm like, no, no, no. We turned up this street and I knew like three blocks away was like where the deli was. And it had stuff I saw, the, like I remember the sale because I'm weird like that. And I'll remember something silly like that. So that was how my dad's like, wait, how the hell did you realize that? I'm like, that's just one of those weird things. That, you know, I'm like, I don't know. You didn't see it when we pulled up? I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> yeah. And my, my dad was like, how does my son know how to get around D.C.? And that, that's that's how I usually do, too, is like when I go somewhere new, I usually try to get lost on purpose so I can find my way around. I mean, not like really lost. I'll try to be like, all right, I'll go five blocks down, five blocks to the right. <laughs> and all right, I'm still kind of in the vicinity, but now I got to figure out how I'm going to get back. But, exactly. Um, but if my wife with me, uh, we, we plan it extra safe. If I'm by myself, yes. I'm more prone to go explore and look around and find shit. Because um, we went to Chicago <laughs> and I was like, you, you gotta be real careful there. I was like, yeah, let's go sightsee and look at some shit. And I, so we jump on the train, which I never been on a train before. And that was, um, an adventure in itself trying to figure out how to get the card and get on the motherfucker. Yeah, that was, they're, they're weird. So we get on the train, we ride above ground to the heart of Chicago and damn, um, we see the bean and all this other tour shit. So, I mean, we, we lost in this motherfucker. We walking around. I'm pulling out my phone trying to figure out shit. I was like, okay, this is cool. All right. So now I'm looking at the thing. It's like, all right, here's another train here that'll take us back to where we need to go. But instead of it being the above ground shit, it's the subway shit. So I'm like, oh, damn. I all never, right. I never been on the subway either. So now we going down under the city into the belly of the beast and I'm, it's getting dark and shit. And I'm like, oh man, it's like, I, I I never been claustrophobic, but being underground like that and having people around me that I didn't really know so well, while I'm holding wine bottles and shit, <laughs> it's just like, all right, I'm kind of nervous. I, I got the I got the wine bottle turned upward. I'm holding it by the neck in case I got to swing it at a motherfucker. <laughs> we, well, that's the way I learned how to do it. You know, especially if you're in a not so nice place. Just for that reason. 
And we, was, was, you know, I, I had a weird thing like that. Like, like my dad, when we would go places, he was uh, someone that was in a lot of trouble most of his life. So being in bad neighborhoods, I was not just because I lived in one as a kid and growing up, but, you know, whatever I did, I was with my dad. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, don't worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. Here you with me. You know what I mean? It's like one of those weird things. I could be in some of the worst places in the world. And my dad was like, yeah, don't worry about that. We're good. I'm like, okay. So as I got older, I became that guy. And when I was in college, all these, like, you know, these weird lily white people that had never been anywhere outside of their nice neighborhood were like, why are you going over there? I'm like, dude, don't worry about it. You with me. And it was so weird how I got that from him. And, you know, even like, like I said, that chip as a kid in D.C. I'm like, yeah, I know, it's only the one block that looked kind of bad, but we could go right over to that deli. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was just yeah. weird stuff like that. I've always had a fascination with just trying to find stuff like that. Uh, like, uh, about eight years ago, I went out to L.A. with my mom and my son. Uh, took my mom out there for the first time. She never visited me in California. She wasn't big on planes. And uh, so, we're, you know, we're in L.A., and she's like, I know what you're going to try and do, you son of a bitch. Don't take me down by Compton or any of that shit just to show me the hood, all right? What the fuck's wrong with you? Don't do that. I'm too old for that shit. I'm like, no, I wasn't planning on doing that. I'm like, but, you know, if we cross paths and we go the long way, it might happen. And then she's like, you better not, you son of a bitch. I'm like, all right, I won't. I won't, I promise. <laughs> yeah, but my thing is, is like, most recently anyway, is just that um, when I go to, um, like, I've always had the dream of going to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. So, Which one? Exactly. You know, I <laughs> I know some people. You got to make sure you go to the good one. You don't want to get stuck in the tourist trap by the airport. All right. So now I know that one. But I heard the one on Pico is the one to go to. <laughs> That's the good one. Yeah. Yeah. So. There's two. There's one by the airport on Pico. But yeah, the one further up on Pico is the good one. All right, so whenever I go to Cali, I want to go there. Uh, when we went to there Chicago, you go. when we went to Chicago, um, I never really got to do it because, like I said, if I was by myself, the shit would have happened. But I was with my wife, so uh, you know she held me close. Oh, of course, yeah. I wanted to get a, <laughs> I wanted to get an authentic Chicago style hot dog and an authentic Chicago style pizza. That's what I wanted. I wanted to go down by the motherfucking. The Bulls Arena and take a picture by the Jumpman statue. Couldn't do that shit either. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I I missed out on that, but I still had a good time. So, see, that's at least the Jordan statue. You should have tried to, you know, plan that you know, at the additional stop on the GPS. <laughs> it was a little, yeah, like I was saying. Oh, so, honey, while we're here, hold on a second. Take a picture of me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just like I I can't really do that because you because um if she got to have a plan and if yeah. we start deviating she's like wait a minute hold on um when we talked about this we were supposed to turn right here on the other street why why are we going this way <laughs> I was like ah oh, my bad I'm, uh, I just, I just missed a turn <laughs> oops never mind sorry you were talking to me I was distracted I'm sorry I know you're just so beautiful your voice is just. Music to my ears. I was, I got lost. <laughs> Sometimes I do that though. It's just like she'll be talking to me just, just to like kind of get off my case of it. Like, you know, you so fine. Say, oh well, thank you. Then I just kind of sneak out the room so I can avoid what was going on. <laughs> exactly. And hopefully she forgets soon enough. Yeah. See, and, and I can say that here because I know she don't listen to the podcast. There you go. <laughs> now she doesn't know the trick. Exactly. So I can come here and vent, feel flarn and filth, and nothing to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, that's another thing I wanted to ask you. Cause, um, sure. speaking of my, my reference just now, there's some Bill Cosby shit. My favorite. That uh, was actually Eddie Murphy making fun of Bill Cosby. Exactly. Exactly. You're right. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> but I was going to, um, okay. <laughs> I was going to ask. What is your favorite stand-up special? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. I, I tell you, I, mine, mine is Bill Cosby that's a himself. Really tough one. Which one? Mine is Bill Cosby himself. That was a good one. I enjoyed that one. I actually had that on record way back when. Did you be a little deviant like me and try to scratch with it? Be like, pick it, pick it. <laughs> Not with that one. I did that with other stuff and, you know, <laughs> had my parents upset with me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, like, Raw, Delirious were, like, so perfect for the time that it happened. Mm -hmm. Like, they were so great. 
and uh, live on Sunset Strip with Richard Pryor was yeah. an amazing special. Uh, George Carlin, New Jersey, great special. Dice Man Cometh was good, mostly for the time, and I got a new appreciation as a comic when I found out why he did The Day the Laughter Died and how he did that, mm -hmm. which is amazing. I'm not sure if, you're, sure if you're familiar. He did an album in 1990 called The Day the Laughter Died, and he was trying to do a sabotage on himself because he was trying to reinvent himself, which yeah. really didn't work as many times as he tried. But what he, So what he did is he went to Dangerfield in New York City on a Tuesday night, knowing it would be empty to do this. And, you know, you know you're only going to get a handful of people on a Tuesday night in the city. Yeah. So he decided, hey, I'm going to record my two-album special here. And went out and just did everything he could to just drone on and just pick on the crowd. It was just, like, so awkward that it made it enjoyable to hear the awkwardness of the crowd and the comedian trying to be more awkward about it. <laughs> it, it, it was a whole different appreciation I got for it. After I found, especially after I found out that he did it purposely to be such a, yeah. a weirdo on it. Oh, man. Oh, man. Monster Rain by Jim Norton. Love that one. The context of it, I'm a little disturbed by, but it was still an amazing, because he's very funny. And you know, he made light of some good personal shit that may creep some people out. But I enjoy that type of stuff. For sure. Now, damn, if you were ever gifted from the Netflix gods or anything like that, you know, how would you f go about formulating your special? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I know, right? Say that again, let me. Like, Say that again. If, if Netflix just came down from the heavens with um, this golden satchel of money and was like, we need you to come up with our special. I mean, what what would be your thought process into, you know, coming up with the material, you know, game planning your show? How would you go about doing it? Uh, well, I don't have an hour straight of material <laughs> right now, but I would take all the 10 minute pieces that I have of everything and try and stretch it as far as I could. I would, you know, if they're paying me that money, I would make sure my other comedian friends would help me make sure I cleaned it up right. Made it, you know, make sure I didn't, you know, had it, all the segues perfect in it and any punchlines I could. And to start out, I'd have to have some, you know, comedian friends of mine to, to try and, you know, be on you just to make fun of me during a special. I, I had a friend of mine that, uh, he didn't get a Netflix special, but he's shopping one to Netflix and a couple other places. Very funny guy, Craig Loigren. He, uh, he filmed his special, and what he did is he had a bunch of us comedians that were close to him sit in the back, you know, of the, of the comedy show, you know, in the green room, and basically just like, oh, my God, that was terrible. What's wrong with you? Why do you even consider doing this? <laughs> you know, it was part of the concept he had going in. He's like, I would want something similar to that. I don't know if it would be exactly like that. But I was only like, do you think that was funny? <laughs> you know, something stupid like that. Yeah. And it's, I, I, you know, it's almost that like, would definitely um, be a part of it. Like, do you, do you listen to um, Eminem? Like yes. some of his older stuff, it was just kind of like how he had the running gag through all his albums with the um, Peter Rosenberg guy. Ken, yeah, well, that is yeah, and Ken Kniff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Ken Kniff from Connecticut. Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it, it, see that, that that's kind of some, some things I think about too, because like um, like I mentioned the comic. Palooza or whatever, they have spots to where podcasters can come there and do live podcasts. And that's things that I right. often think about, like, how would I go about doing something like that? Because, like, here we are, me and you, I just called you up, told you that I was going to do my intro, and then we're just going to talk shit. And that's what we've been doing for the past hour or so. And yeah, I don't know how I would go about doing something like that in a live setting, you know, with people just sitting out there in the audience. Because me, personally, like, when I was doing the teaching or whatever, you know, I was there for the audience, you know, so I, all I had, I was interacting with them all the time, you know, asking them questions and, you know, getting feedback from them in that standpoint. But to go up there and do a podcast or even stand up, it's not like I'm gonna be sitting up there just talking to the crowd and asking them questions the whole time, you know? <laughs> right, right. 
So yeah, it's, it's yeah. I mean, hopefully, I I mean, I the, the dirty rumor is in this game. At a certain point, your age is going to be a hindrance, and I'm well past that point. So if that happened to me, I would do anything I could to you know. It's going to be my only shot, so I got to go all out. Most likely, it'll be my only shot if, they, if that happens. So I'm you know I'd be very welcome to it, and I would put it all together. I'm like, boom, here we go. And if I needed to, I would have some actual better people, you know, do some guest spots in front of me or something. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like, um, usually they have those shows to where they, you know, they have, you know, the opening act. I mean, you know how this shit work. You know, they had the opening act. They got oh, the yeah, yeah. Band, and then you have your headliner and all that stuff. And that's, you know, I would do that. I would get some people I know that know me well and get the ball rolling on that one. I, I would first of all, I would love that opportunity. I know it's not going to happen, but hey, you, you could dream, right? A girl could dream. <laughs> and, and you know, this kind of like I, I don't know. I'm I'm still thinking about it. You know, trying to knock that edge, that nervous edge off of me or whatever. It's just like I know when I get up there, I'm gonna want to talk to the crowd. And I'm gonna be like, I want to ask them questions and shit. <laughs> it'd be like it'd be like a reverse Q and A and shit. <laughs> Some people are that do comedy are better at their crowd work than their comedy. You'd be surprised. I know a few people that are like that, and it's amazing watching them work a crowd. You know, and it, you have some other people because their crowd work is so good that their act becomes their crowd work. It's like you know, you know, you're gonna have like the bald guy in every crowd. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you have your set of bald jokes that you can pick on somebody that's the bald guy in the audience. Or you, you're like, oh, look at that shirt. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a specific shirt. You can pick out something that's outstanding, you know, just from observing it. And it's crowd work, but it's still set material at the same time. And I, I, I uh, Big J. Okerson, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He is excellent with that. Because basically that's his whole show. And he did, it's almost all crowd work. And it's actually set work, though. It's not like all new material. It's the same material, but he has it fitting with the crowd that's there. Mm-hmm. And he's able to... And, you know, instead of Jim, it's, you know, Joe. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, Joe, look at that. You know, oh, the ball guy in the back. Oh, look at you. I can see my balls like that. He looks like my balls, you know, the way it's shaped like that. You know what I mean? I got you. Because, like, um, being relatable and everything, because, like, so when you was talking about just now how he would pick on the bald guy or whatever, and I, I automatically try to relate to something like that. It's like in my head when you said it, I was like, "Man, shit, I was bald when I was twenty three or whatever." And then you know I could think exactly. about all the the silly times to where I was still trying to go get a haircut and shit and make my shit look straight or whatever. But yeah, my, <laughs> my edge up was fucked up in the motherfucker. It's like straight across here. Then when he got to the right corner, it did like a forty five this way. I was like, "All right." <laughs> Looks like Charlie Brown's shirt design. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like it looked like I had the bottom part of the bat symbol on my forehead or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, it, but that that's like I think about that a lot. It's just like when people talking and, and everything. I'm always listening to be like, all right, I got something that I could, I got a story that you know, relates to that. And then that's kind of like how it would go. Yeah, you know, that's one way of doing it. Yeah. Come on, think about this. You, you've talked in front of enough crowds in your life, right? Mm-hmm. Every crowd, for the most part, you have kind of the same people everywhere you go. Yeah. There's always one guy that's one way. There's another guy. There's a lady that laughs weirdly the whole time. You know what I mean? No matter what the situation, she's just giggling silly for no reason. It's like, oh, my God. You know, and you can always say something about that type of person. And there's people that actually make a living doing that. God bless them. Shit, I, with, um, I watch professional wrestling. So there's always this one time or another to where they always have this one lady that's screaming so goddamn loud it sounds like she getting murdered at the goddamn show. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, ah! I was like, is that lady okay? <laughs> yeah. Now, I haven't watched in a while. Who is that lately? What? What? Like, it's, who's the screamer in wrestling? Oh, no. I'm talking about like people in the crowd. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I agree with that as well. No, sometimes you usually have one wrestler, or you know, whether it's the heel or whatever, that always has one. Ah, it's like, dude, you didn't even hit you. Stop. 
Now, what I've noticed, you know, to just tr- get away from wrestling, I watch a lot of movies. And All right. what I'm, you know, not so much like people's acting ability or whatever, but a lot of the times when I'm watching um, action movies or some of these other horror movies, it's like I pick up on some of the same sounds over and over again. It's like they always got this. Yeah, same- there's a lot of them that they reuse. Yeah. That happens. Especially like in some of these action movies when the motherfucker fall off of something high, they always got that one track where you'd be like, wow, or something like that. And yeah. you hear like 30 different movies or whatever. I was like, I heard that in this other movie. That would be an interesting thing to track down all the ones that have been reused more than twice. Now, I know somebody who would probably do that. <laughs> There's got to be somebody out there. I'm not saying I have the time to do that or the patience to do that. But I would love to find that research out. I like that's something I'd be curious. Like if I become a billionaire overnight for something stupid, that's one of the things. I'm like, yeah, let's look into this. Yeah, that'll be. That'll I'll, be. I'll drive. We're using a million dollars to find that out. Go ahead. Yeah, that that be silly. That'll be your uh, your lottery um, pick. Yeah. <laughs> be like, I just won the lottery. I got four hundred million dollars. I'm going. <laughs> that's what I was about to say. Do you have the Powerball down there? <laughs> yes, sir. Is four hundred something? Uh, yeah, four hundred. That's right. <laughs> That's what gave it away. That's what I was going to ask you. That he said, I'm like, he must have it. Let me just be sure, though. Yeah, yeah. Be like, I, I win the motherfucking lottery. I'm like, all right, I'm going to take a million off top. I'm going to give it to this dude. His name is Sean Cone or whatever. And this is what <laughs> this is what he do. Like, no shit. You go to his YouTube page, and he's one of those guys that, like, you ever seen those um videos where they make they take all these clips of the president and they make him like sing a song or some shit. Uh, okay. Yeah, he does shit like, like that. He, he does shit like that. So this dude, he got a um a supercut that he's been doing. He's been going through a whole bunch of Burt Reynolds movies or some shit. And he has nice. a, a two hour cut that he did uh from going through all these Burt Reynolds movies that he formed into this one video of Sir I don't know what it is exactly yet. Because he hadn't um, put it out yet, but he was telling me about it. And then, all right, and he d- he just does shit like that. I mean, nobody's paying him to do it. He just does it on his own. And then, um, is he getting a lot of hits? Yeah, uh, he did another video. Good for called, him. He doing a, he did another video, <laughs> and is uh, it's funny as fuck to me. I watched it like two or three times. It, he went through uh, a ass load of Jim Carrey movies. And he's okay. And he spliced together all the parts in the, all his movies to when he fell down. Anytime he fell down in a movie, <laughs> he put them all together in this one little cut or whatever. And you can watch this on this page, and you can see all the times that Jim Carrey fell down in a movie. So then he got another video that's um he got like two. I have to check that out. He got two point four million hits on it. Um. The Sandler's the Sandler verse. It links every Adam Sandler film together, like through some kind All of right. way. And then um, he did something to where um, he cut a whole bunch of different movies together. Of people saying the Gettysburg Address. So he took like words from all these different movies and he strung it together into the Gettysburg Address. So that's a good talent. Yeah, so he's the meticulous motherfucker that'll sit there and do some shit like that. So I'm I'm coming with my million dollars and I'm paying Sean <laughs> that shit. There you go. So I already got my guy. I just gotta win the, the fucking Powerball Mega Million and shit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so hopefully you win because I want to see that. Exactly. I, I might try to coerce him into doing it without the money. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I didn't win, but this is what I was going to do if I won. What do you think? Try it. <laughs> Pretty please. So the next time he's bored, he can find that out. Exactly, man. Because, I mean, he said he... Two hours. Two fucking hours. <laughs> the video wind up being two hours, but you know how much film... And yeah, that she- means he put about 30 hours of research into it. Exactly. And then, hey, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> I can't. Eat. I'm I'm having troubles sitting here binging twelve season fucking episodes and shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, twelve episodes, one seasons and shit. And he up here thirty, forty fucking hours splicing shit together for a twenty minute video. <laughs> exactly. 
Hey, yeah. So some of those are tough, though. I, I've got a couple uh, couple comedian friends of mine there. That's like a new big thing, that, especially with some of us older comics. We have to have as many things out there as we can. So um, my one friend, Gerald, I did a couple of videos with him. And you can find them uh, on my Instagram, Dave Hodge. Uh, I did one there in uh, Gerald Bedford's uh, Gerald Comedy. That's his Instagram. He's done several on his own, but I did two with him. The one I did was on both of our pages, and one of them is only on his right now. But uh, one about, like, how he has to pay a lot of child support. Then another one where I happened to play a gay man trying to hit on him for 10 grand. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Now, now is that another thing that you um try to do? Like I know you just said it, but like um the little sketch comedy joints. Um, it's a very new thing that I'm trying to do, and I've come up with three ideas for myself that I haven't fully written out. I just have the concepts, and I, you know, comes down to having the time to write the stuff out and then find the people that if you gotta have people in it, be in it, and make sure they're able to commit and all that fun stuff. But that's something I'm looking to do. I'm not looking to go whole, you know, wholehearted at the sketches, but I do want to have some good content out there. Yeah, and that, that's another thing too. Is just like I want to have more outside of the podcast. But the only reason I want to have those things outside of the podcast is to draw people to the podcast. <laughs> exactly. So I want more content that people see me being fun and silly, so they can find me to do comedy and. Maybe somebody in their local town will book me for a gig or, you know, or if they're in the area, they'll find out, hey, he's here this night. All right, we can go find out. I saw that guy's video. We'll go see him. Yeah. Now, <laughs> this, this has been a thing for two years now. Um, I go to Walmart damn near every day, like no lie. And um, usually when I go to Walmart, I do an Instagram video. So I do a thing. Okay. So I. It's a thing I called um, the Walmart log, you know. So if you okay. if you get on Instagram and you do hashtag Walmart log, you'll find all the videos that I've done. But moving from Missouri, my last duty station to here to Houston, I can honestly say because I just found a new Walmart today. I've been to damn <laughs> I've, I've been to damn near thirty WalMarts since being here in Houston. Damn near. <laughs> wow, and it's. I just, well, Houston's a big place. Exactly, and I haven't even—I don't even think that's the—I scratched the surface yet. Because, <laughs> like, um, when I first got into this uh, security job, it had me going to different places around Houston or whatever. And it seems like every time I would get on the interstate to go to a different uh, post, I would see a new Walmart, and I'd be like, "Oh shit, I gotta remember that. I gotta go back and do a video in there." <laughs> I stopped by there on the way home so I could do a video. <laughs> exactly. I, I, sometimes I found myself making up excuses to go to Walmart just so I can do a video. And then I'm gonna have to pee right now. Let me pull in there and do. <laughs> hell yeah! I mean, it's almost mandatory that I go there every Tuesday because that's when they release the new DVDs and shit. So I gotta go see what new movies they got. I never knew that. Now I know what to do next time I'm there. Exactly. Every Tuesday, new releases. And then um, it just became a thing because somebody said they didn't like Walmart. So I went to Walmart and I filmed a video of me doing all the things they said they didn't like about Walmart. Like people leaving carts. That's even funnier. Like people leaving carts in the middle of the um, parking lot. Uh, <laughs> just stupid shit. Just because somebody. Riding like, the bicycle through the aisles, you know. Yeah, well, that's, or is that just me? I don't know. That's kind of diff- <laughs> That's kind of difficult. When you by yourself, because like you got to hold the camera and try to steady the bike. I mean, I could do it, but it's just like my son doesn't mind being the cameraman. He doesn't want me be doesn't want to, doesn't want to be a part of most of my shenanigans. Though. Yeah, see <laughs> that video I was telling you about with the local comedian Foxy. My son was the cameraman, and Foxy cuss more than anybody I know. So my nice. my f- well fourteen at the time when we did the video, she was like. She's like, you little motherfucker. <laughs> just like, and my son is just like, what? I was like, man, you heard me say worse than that. <laughs> so that shit was funny as hell. <laughs> and But the thing about my son being a cameraman, I got to tell him to be the cameraman. Because like, if you yeah. ever go watch that video, he damn button in the conversation and shit. I'm like, shut the fuck up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> 
you're behind the scenes today. Yes, you're behind the camera. <laughs> Next time we'll do a different video with you in the video. Yeah, usually it's a video. Of, if he on video, it's me whipping his ass. Not like I like wrestling style. Not for real, for real. <laughs> Oh, I know, I got you. But then it'll be a whole different set of circumstances. I yeah. totally understand that. You know, my my uh, my parents, like, like I said, my I don't hit my son, but he knows the threat's real because I told him how my mom used to show me how she would hide the bruises from diapers. So he he knows the threat is real. Yeah. I just don't, haven't had to cross that threshold, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. The, the one video I am working on with my son that I, I one of the ones I'm trying to you know I had the concept I just kind of I'm trying to merge two concepts that happen. My son, a lot of times, will, I'll take him with me to do comedy just yeah. because I don't want to leave him alone. I may be gone for a while. I'm going to be in the city. Maybe I can, you know, take him out to eat or something afterwards or, you know, have some fun with him with it. Yeah. And one time we went out, uh, there was a, a comedian there, a female comedian, kind of attractive. And uh, she just says, hey, well, fuck it. Let's just take the kid to the next bar. I got some cocaine. We can party. He looks cute. I'm like, yeah, he's 15. No, that's not what we're trying to do here. <laughs> And my son's like, well, yeah, he's like, are you cock popping me? Or I'm glad you're not asking me to go to the bar and do cocaine, but what is that? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying cool. to murder some stuff like that. And <laughs> also, one time, uh, a couple of years ago, I was in New Orleans, and we, you know, we took a walk up Bourbon Street, and of course, the strippers that were calling me into the bar didn't happen to see I was with a child. But I said, listen, I'm with my son. Now, I'm not saying I don't want him in there, but as long as he's allowed to go in, we're both getting lap dances. Where's the manager? I'm ready to go in. I just want I want clearance first. So of course we're like, oh fuck you, man. It's all, uh. <laughs> I'm like, listen, I'll do it. I just want to make sure you know that he's a child. So I'm trying to merge those two concepts. It's a one little, you know, short Instagram video where I could, you know, come up with a a girl that's like a stripper or a comedian or comedian slash stripper trying to do cocaine with my son and party while I'm with somebody else. I don't know. I'm I'm working it all out in my head. I'm a weirdo. Yeah, and that that's. I think I get into my own way sometimes because I mean, this is audio exactly. This is audio proof all across these podcasts <laughs> or whatever. Me saying, "Oh man, I want to do this and this and this or whatever," and it's just like me cock blocking myself. It's just like, all right, I, I got this idea. I want to go do this, but I ain't got the camera I want because I want it to look a certain way. And I'm just like, dude, just go get the fucking shit. Hold the goddamn button on the Instagram video. Say what the fuck you guys say and get the shit over with. <laughs> yeah, that's the easiest way, man. Because, I mean, I, there was a point in time to where most recently on my Instagram, I was in there actually trying to do some production value and shit. I was damn, I would go in there, I would make the video, then I would bring the video, I would take it home, then I would cut the shit together on my phone, I would add like little graphic effects and all kind of shit. I was like, dog. It, it took me less time to make the video than it is to fucking put all this extra shit in there. <laughs> I said, I yeah, just, sometimes that happens too. I said, I'll just put it in the comments. They can read that shit. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but sir, I usually when I have somebody that's uh, engaging in a profession and yours is comedy or podcasting or whoever else um, comes on. Or both. Through, or both at the same time. Where do you see or where would you like your um, to be in the next two years? Comedy wise, I definitely uh, definitely want a ton more paying gigs. You know, because comedy doesn't always pay the bills. Mm -hmm. But you know, even when it does, it's not paying the bills. I would like to you know have some more productive you know paying shows, and uh, you know, I get I get what I get here and there do some stuff throughout and my goal is to keep doing that a little more steady and with the podcast I definitely you know I'm getting more equipment and stuff so I'm trying to have that be a little more productive as well yeah and you try not to cock block your son I, I definitely don't want to do that but I, I know somebody that has once already so you know <laughs> shit happens <laughs> all right man before we head off into that good night uh well, I got a quick question for you now yes sir before we had it today. Well, shit, we don't have you to go anywhere. Send me all the questions. <laughs> you, you're from Louisiana? Yes, sir. Whereabouts? Lake Charles. Okay. So I, I have some, you know, family, friends of the family in Metairie, and I was just curious. With that trip I was in the world with my son that I was just mentioning, uh, we also went to Blue Bayou. 
Oh yeah, which is a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Love that place. I, it was. I enjoyed that more than I enjoyed Slitterbond over in Texas. <laughs> Sorry, Texas. <laughs> yeah. Good old. I'm sorry. What were you saying before I rudely interrupted? Well, no, nah, I was trying to wrap you down, man. I was going to say, tell everybody where they can find you on all social media platforms and wherever else you want them to find you at. Uh, DaveHodge.com, H O J, D A V E H O J. Also, you can find me on Twitter at The Hodger, uh, Dave Hodge on Instagram. You can find me, Dave Hodge, on Facebook. Hit me up, say hi, people. And uh, Monday nights on Comfortably Funny Podcast. Check us out. We stream on Facebook Live. You can sign up. You know, you can uh, like our page on Facebook as well. Uncomfortably FU on Twitter. Man, I'm looking at your Instagram. You got damn 14,000. I'm a whore. Fucking followers. <laughs> I've been, mostly since I've been putting up some of those videos, man, it's been a boost. Yeah, well, I'm going to start putting your videos on my shit then. <laughs> uh, please do. I would like that. <laughs> Oh, look Especially at you. That, that one that's up there, the main one, I believe, is the one with me being a, a creepy guy trying, you know, trying to solicit sex with my friend Gerald. So there you go. Look, look at you and your, your fatigues. <laughs> ah, yeah. Lots of stuff on there. Yes, I'm stalking your Instagram as we speak. Not a problem. Feel free. <laughs> like something. So I say, oh, who's that? I'm like, oh, yeah. Let me go and, you know, make sure I check out the uh, the Walmart stuff from you. Yes, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right man uh once again thank you for being a part of the show i appreciate you giving me your time not a problem man. thank you as well i appreciate everything i will talk to you soon man let me know when this is up yes sir i sure will all right i'll talk to you soon all right Bye. and that was mr Dave Hodge. I call him Mr. because he older than me. <laughs> but it was a pleasure and a delight to have the man on the show. Um, I don't know. I kind of felt like I was stepping on a lot of shit because I, you know, through him, you know, because he actually does stand up comedy and everything. I was kind of like hi- hyping myself up, you know, just trying to you know, see what his mindset is, how he approaches things, you know, to kind of, you know, apply it to what I'm trying to do or whatever. Because, I mean, it's coming. I want to try to do a live podcast. I don't know where and how I'm going to come about it. I'm pretty sure I can find a venue to host it. But, you know, as you heard me mention moments ago or whatever, it's like, how? I'm going to do that shit. You know what I'm, what the fuck I'm going to talk about? I'm going to just go up on stage with a guest or something and just talk shit and ignore the audience or, <laughs> you know, I'm just be sitting out there. I'm be chatting with the guy in the front row just looking at me awkwardly and shit. So I don't know. But in any case, fucking where they breathe. <laughs> and if, if you, if you don't get the reference. You know, he he he, t- he said he heard his mom say that, but he tells the story on the Po' Boys podcast. So look up Jody B and find that episode with Dave Hodge on it if you want the full story. But yeah, I also had some bonus content this week for this episode. Um, it was by a band that hit me up on Twitter called Th- the 390 Band. Um, I have conveniently misplaced the email with their music in it that they sent me. So maybe next episode, I'll try to fit that in somewhere or whatever. I'm going to try to extend the hand out to them here pretty soon and have them on as a guest. So there we can talk about their music and everything. All right. Um, Haven't really announced it too much yet. We're still working out the kinks and everything. I got a motherfucking sponsor. Hey, if um you're familiar with the hashtag blackout podcast, um, we are always constantly talking about the brand hooks, rubs and spices. And that is the sponsor, the official sponsor of the random rounds with Rob podcast hooks, rubs and spices. How you like that? Ha ha. Big time now. So if you're interested in getting some of them delicious hooks, rubs, and spices, you can go to their website on Etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash 
hooks, rubs, and spices, all one word. Or you can just go to Etsy and type in hooks, rubs, and spices. I don't know why I paused like that. I was just trying to stall (laughs) so I could tell you about it. But, you know, you can get the mad cow. They got some uh, lemon pepper. What else we got? We got the smoking sweetness. And we got the smoking. uh, We already said smoke sweetness. We got smoky burn. I'm doing horrible with the sponsorship already. (laughs) But. I've tried all, well, no, I've only tried the smoky burn and the smoky sweetness. That's the only two I've tried. I have not tried the mad cow yet or the lemon pepper, which both sound delicious, but I can tell you for a fact that smoky sweetness, because I mean, I like the flavor, the spice on my food, but I ain't trying to burn my taste buds out like my wife would do. So, I mean, if you like that hot shit, go and jump on that, uh, the smoking sweet, no, the smoking burn, smoky burn, smoky burn. I say burn funny, burn, burn, like Mr. Burns. Try that smoky burn if you like that hot shit. But the smoking sweetness is where it's at. I put that on everything. Put it in my spaghetti, everything. Put it on my green beans, everything. I had it on some cauliflower, everything. That shit is delicious. So go on get you some of them hooks, rubs, and spices. I'm going to have some uh, promo codes and everything so y'all can get some discounts, get you like 15% off and everything. So be working out the kinks, baby. And if you still vape, you can go to vapepanda.com. I mean, they're not a sponsor per se, but I know somebody who knows somebody to get you 15% off if you use the promo code 3RSHOW at checkout. Yeah. It's coming, coming together, baby. I'm going to get some hooks, rubs, and spices, and merchandise out there for you. And, you know, it's a product I can get behind. I believe in it because it's delicious. Um, they got some, they got a catch slogan. They say, uh, we smoke the meats or we put it on our meats or <laughs> some shit like that. And every time I hear it, I'm a, I'm a horrible sponsor, uh, sponsor E or whatever the fuck. But every time I hear it, I was just like, they're putting stuff on their meat, like penis meat. And every time I call into the hashtag blackout podcast and I leave them a voicemail, I always leave them with hooks, rubs and spices anecdote. So like I'll call in, I'll say whatever random florin filth that I'm going to say that came from the Eddie Murphy special when he was in person's name, Bill Cosby. And I damn, I'll be like, on oh, when I sign out, I'll be like hooks, rubs and spices on your left side titty meat. I just make up something and I say that. But as long as you put hooks, rubs, and spices on it, it'll be all good. All right. I'm done rambling. Hope you enjoyed the show. And I, I, like I said, I know I was kind of stepping on my guests because I was, it's, it, to me in my head, I mean, you, you, you formulate your own conclusions, but it sounded like I was just hyping myself up because I wanted to do, I kind of want to do what he's doing. And I felt like, you know, cause I had more questions. I wanted to ask him about his first Thai hooker or his first Korean hooker <laughs> or anything like that. So, but there's always next time. And he has a show. I can probably go on his show. We'll hook it up. I'll make up for that. I felt like I did bad and I could have did better, but it was still a good conversation. Nonetheless, that's just me in my head. So, as long as you're listening, you're liking, retweeting, and sharing, that's the most important thing you can do for the show. But if you ever did decide to support monetarily or anything like that, you can be a patron by going to randomrobcast.com and clicking the patron button through Podbean. Or you can use Amazon links. Anytime you shop at Amazon, as long as you use my links, you don't pay anything extra. I get a little kickback. I also have some merchandise. If you have the artistic skill to come up with some stuff inspired by the Random Rounds with Rob podcast, I would very much so appreciate it. Shoot it my way. I even kick you a little something your way. I might even see some hooks, rubs, and spices if you so desire. Um, also, there's a Amazon wish list on there if you want to purchase equipment for the show so we can do more things up and over here. It'll be greatly appreciated. But once again, you don't have to spend a dime of your money. 
the most important thing you can do for this podcast and any other podcast you listen to is to write that review five stars or less but we would prefer we would prefer five stars it would be greatly appreciated like subscribe retweet tell a friend listen if you're in idaho Vermont <laughs> or Alaska. I'm still trying to get total United States coverage. Tell somebody to listen to the goddamn show, motherfuckers. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm done. You can find me on Twitter at it's B Rob I T S B R O B. And you can also find the show on Twitter at three R show. You can follow me on Instagram to where you can see me walk through the hollowed halls of the Walmart. Yeah. Where hopefully one day soon in the future, you will find hooks, rubs and spices in your spices aisle. <laughs> but hey, I'm sorry to the 390 band for not playing your music because I lost the email because I'm a dumbass. My bad. But hey, we'll work it out next time and I'll see you next time. Your face is coming straight to your ears A podcast network that's changing gears Bringing fresh funky pods with a fresh funky beat A family of pods that are bringing the heat There ain't no stopping us Keep coming back to us Sick ass pods that'll make you hush www.hushyourface www.hushyourface www.hushyourface.com www.hushyourface.com